So if there's one thing that I know about the future of AI, it's that it involves comfortable chairs. All right, so we got we got our chairs coming in here. Great. Um, I would like to um, bring a couple of special people up to the stage, starting with uh, someone who has been the leading voice for developers at Google. Uh, you might call her the patron saint of Google, someone I've worked with for many years. Uh, Janine Banks, come on up. Thanks, Steve. Great, thanks, Janine. Please Good have a seat here. You. Great to see you. What is this handshake? What is this handshake? <laughs> <All right. laughs> And then uh, we have someone who has uh, been at the forefront of the development of AI for an extremely long time. Uh, he's currently leading uh, work in generative AI at DeepMind. Oriol Vignoles, come on up. Oh, fist bumps. All right, look at that. We are so cool. All right, um, so uh, you both have fancy titles. Um, what did you actually do on Gemini? Uh, on Gemma, sorry. <laughs> All the gems. Yeah, yeah what, what are you uh, doing, Gemma? <laughs> so I've had a blast. First of all, hey, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, glad to see so many familiar faces, but also many I haven't spoken to, so look forward to the break where we get a chance to get acquainted. Um, so at Google, I've just had a blast the last several months. It's been crazy, really. Uh, having a chance to work with Dee and with Oriel's team and so many other teams, uh, figuring out how we bring all of this exciting innovation that you've been hearing from Tris and Dee and Anne uh, to all of you, <laughs> to our developer community. So from Gemini and the new APIs, our Google AI Studio, uh, the Gemma models, how we make everything work with Kaggle, Vertex. Okay, that's starting to sound like an alphabet soup. <laughs> uh, but really, how do we make that simple, easy stuff that you can actually build with, be more productive and not less. It's been fun. Yeah, cool. And, and Oriel, what, what, what did you do? Yeah, I mean, likewise, great to be here uh, and, and talk to many of you who are users um, uh, and happy to build together, really. Um, I've been uh, co-leading the Gemini project with uh, Jeff Dean. It's been indeed like a pretty like, wild year, extremely fun. I've never had so much fun in the last 10 years that I, I work at Google. So. Um, yeah, happy to share a bit of you know my point of view on all of this, and yeah, looking forward to the to the chat. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, all right. So we've got some hard hitting questions here, um, Janine. So um, I mean, obviously, you've been a developer for many years. You've developed across all kinds of industries. Um, if you were to pick one sort of application area that you've been fascinated by, what's that been, and how would it be different with the AI tools that are available today? Okay. Well, first, I have to. Disclaimer, right up front. Uh, if you ever ask me to pick one thing, I won't. <laughs> I have seen <laughs> That is true. You've seen this in real life. I have. So uh, really what fascinates me a lot about different applications that I've seen over the years, and like you said, uh, being in, working with different industries, uh, ge geographies, um, is, you know, while there's so much happening with Gen AI and uh, the advancements that you're going to hear about, uh, Actually, I'm, I'm probably a little old, what you call old fashioned. Uh, so it's, it's really one of those things that haven't really changed that much. Maybe 50 years, 100 years, it's been done the same way. Um, that gets me really intrigued when I see those spaces being changed and these technologies being applied there. So, for example, uh, healthcare, I think everybody would agree that uh, hasn't changed that much. Uh, okay. Yes, you agree. <laughs> um, and so, so, you know, back in, let's say, 2012, 13, I was at GE Healthcare. And we were looking at how to improve the productivity of physicians uh, who actually have a lot of our lives in their hands uh, many times. Uh, who's had an X-ray or an MRI uh, past 10 years, maybe, I think. Yeah. And so from from that standpoint, what we found is that uh, you take these diagnostic tests and it seems like a black box. You get the exam done, you go to your doctor, they tell you some information. But in reality, there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes. And there's a specialist called a radiologist who has to go and look at your historical record, understand your family history, uh, pull together a lot of different information together manually, using their expertise, of course. And, and then they use that to figure out how to look at these scans, how to figure out what's going on there and interpret what they're seeing. And then they manually write 
down there are observations which make their way back to your referring physician who then tells you what's going on so when we were working on a project the GE research team and my team uh, I was responsible for some diagnostic imaging software products we said how do we automate some of that manual work uh, and then also how do we make the accuracy of the diagnosis itself actually better and back then it was like 20% of diagnoses were wrong actually wrong on average uh, if you look at the global numbers. So we said, how do we improve that? And so we applied uh, machine learning to this problem uh, by being able to say, all that data that needs to be connected, how about we train uh, some models to be able to recognize uh, the best way for physicians to look at those images, the best way to interpret them. Uh, we called it smart reading protocols. Uh, and so without going into too much detail about the physician workflow, it turned out that we were able to to drive something like 80% uh, improved productivity for physicians. This is equated to something like three hours saved in their day, right? And I've been in hospitals with 3,000 beds. <laughs> if physicians have to look at all of those scans every single day, those three hours per day really count. Um, and so that was just a really fascinating application, one of the most that I've seen. Uh, that I, but I think if you fast forward to now, there's some cool things we could do to make that even better, Absolutely. right? And so that report that your physician sends to you and it's manually written, well, maybe some summarization might help, right? And automating some of that. Or also you can augment that using RAG uh, infrastructure to be able to add more context and improve the quality of the prompts that you're submitting in. Um, I think there are also ways to connect the dots with the visual aspect as well as the written and being able to tie those things together. So I think there are some really cool things we could do with those workflows going forward. Yeah, no, and it's hard to imagine a more important use case, truly. Um, or let's uh, let's... Speaking of old-fashioned, um, you know, you've been involved in uh, machine learning and AI for a long time. Back before LLMs were called LLMs, we used to call them LSTMs, and you were in on that as well. Um, what are some of the biggest changes you've seen over the last uh, decade or so in this space? Yeah, it's, I mean, super interesting question um, because so much has changed. I mean, one memory that flashes back at me now is I remember when all of the researchers that did deep learning in the world would probably not even fill this room. And here we are, right? So I think, um, you know, it's just looking back and it's not that long ago, although you make it sound like it was a long time ago. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, well, you old fashioned. Yeah, yeah, old fashioned. <laughs> I mean, we'll see. Anyways, um, jokes aside, but I mean, I think the maturity from trying to actually convince, right, the field that applications such as this one, that this technology will transform it to actually seeing it uh, go mainstream. Um, but indeed, it's still in a way, I, I agree with the vision that Tree said. I mean, it's kind of, it also feels early days, right? That That is the main change that I've seen from a more academic research field to the levels of maturity that we're starting to see, but but then also looking ahead, like the opportunity to yeah. build is yeah, quite yeah, massive. Yeah, look, yeah. look ahead. What do you see coming in the next year or so? What, what's something an interesting challenge? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, again, Teresa and I talk often, so it's not going to be a surprise, but um, it was really fun to see how developers build on top of Gemini 1.5. And I'm particularly impressed. Every day I go and open like social media and I see sort of um, how multimodal and long context come together in interesting ways that we that created the model that we knew the capability didn't quite anticipate that surprise every day um, and just thinking of the year and the years ahead it definitely keeps me keeps me you know pushing awesome well what's uh what's one of the most surprising things you've seen the developer community use maybe maybe from Janine you think you go with that one thing again? Uh, um, <laughs> no, it's a um, theme. <laughs> okay, we've only got five and a half. Okay, so, you can also, do okay, okay. Right. so um, well, honestly, I think that uh, like we just said, it's, it's early. So I never put anything past developers. They they tend to pick up these things quickly, figure them out, try things that you didn't think about. Um, so I wouldn't say one particular or even two applications uh, have surprised me, but actually, it's what. I haven't seen that's actually more surprising to me, which is that if you look at all of the exper experimentation, um, I think our you know developers here with us today um, experimenting or building applications in some, some shape or form, um, but such a small percent of those are being deployed in production. 
and then even then so at scale, right? And so then you might ask why, right? And what can we do to help developers to be able to productionize these applications and scale them uh, to, to their meet their needs? And I think that part of what has happened is this bifurcation in uh, software or application development stacks. On the one hand, we're talking about all this amazing innovation and uh, Gen AI and all the surrounding ecosystem that kind of growing up around that, that's changing literally every layer of the stack for how you build, um, that's great. And you can build entirely new applications from the ground up. But there's still a lot of the traditional stacks, right? Um, and you have your database, you have your data processing pipelines, you have your business logic layer and APIs and the UI, and you have all the traditional things. So then the question is, what's the bridge? Like, how do I go from having these existing applications, which there are millions in the world today, to leveraging all this amazing new things to transform and modernize what I'm providing to my users and actually gives them a great experience. So I think that bifurcation is one of the barriers, but I'm really optimistic. Uh, I think the work that we're doing at Google and also others in the open source community that are definitely going to bridge that gap. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I, I'm if I might add yeah, something, please, just please, I mean, one, one thing that resonates from what Janine said is that uh, as researchers, we tend to, yes, think like sort of everything is new, like this technology will end to end, right? This is a word we use often to train the models, but also it's going to transform everything end to end. But yeah, reality is that it is going to be part of a complex system. And maybe as a researcher, you don't think about that. So that's a very interesting thought that you know i'll come i'll go, uh, hopefully like something comes out of this but yeah good yeah, good no, point yeah s systems are models too um mm. when you're thinking about you know each of you have a role in helping to shape google's overall approach to how uh google is creating generative ai to to really help developers what are some principles that you're keeping in mind as, as you're doing that you want to start yeah you can start oh so <laughs> nice. um well you know and really touched on it you know this this point about the obligation we have to do things in a responsible um, and, and safe way uh, when we open up uh, models and, and, and from how our procedures and approach to releasing them, but also supporting the community as they build with them. Uh, so th I think from a principal standpoint, I see a lot of parallels in AI development to the early growth of the open web. And alongside that, we saw earlier on, like, yes, there's going to be tons of positive benefit for people, but then there are some bad actors that have the wrong intentions, right? And so alongside the growth of the open web, we had all of the, we had private and uh, public institutions that work to figure out how to make things safe. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's going to be important, not just at Google and the processes or approaches we take, but how do we work with the c community? How do we work with other organizations? And so just like with uh, security, you had consortiums that formed. I remember back in 2004, at the risk of dating myself, um, <laughs> I was working closely with ISC Squared and figuring out how to bring CISSP certification to more people so that they can build their security skills um, and, and be able to go into organizations to help them strengthen and harden these systems. Um, I think that there's also been amazing startups that and, and open source projects that help grow that ecosystem. So I, I think that's a key principle in our approach is not just what can we open up, but how do we partner together to do things like shepherding the definition of open source AI, like Anne talked about, or whether it is, you know, what are those best practices for how to do things in the safest way? I, I loved how we re released the responsive, uh, generative AI responsible, uh, responsible generative AI uh, toolkit uh, with Gemma. So that's an example. Yeah, yeah I was very proud of that. Yeah, Oriel, but more to add from your side. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's been super fun to see um, is what people are doing with Gemini 1.5. And that's obviously you have the models, they are ready. And then you might, you know, stage a bit like how these models will affect um, users, the world, etc. And one thing we did there very intentionally was to open for developers first. Um, so that because there's a nat natural synergy, right? Someone wants to build something amazing. And we think the model is amazing. So let's see what happens. So think moving forward, that process of 
um, model is ready. Let's put it to the hands of amazing creative minds like yourselves. Uh, that's just sort of something that I, I think we'll, we'll keep doing as, as a principle um, as we build next generation models with new capabilities it's for you to all like test them out. Tell us, you know, failure modes, definitely successes and share all that you want with us. Yeah. And, and what I would just add to that, too, is I, I think about the conversations we had in terms of like the long roadmap of things that we can imagine. Um, and I I'm glad that we decided to go out there because, like you said, regardless of the things we can imagine, you all can imagine way more <laughs> than we can. Um, so getting that input like days like today, but even just in general, uh, really is something we factor in um, so we can continue to improve and, and, and build this out. Yeah. Okay, so I, I see that we're out of time, but I'm going to sneak in one last question here because I, I think it's important. Um, so Janine, you are, are you know the voice of developers, and uh, you're speaking on behalf of, of the 300 or so people here in this room, and you have an opportunity here to put Oriel on the spot on their behalf and ask him for something here. From your perspective, what would you ask Oriel and team to focus on as they're developing the next wave of generative AI models for developers? Well, I'm glad you qualified it, Dee, because like the first part of your question, I was getting ready, like thinking of large sums of money. And I was like, OK, but OK, you qualified it. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, building out this this technology and these really powerful models, um, it, it comes with a lot of responsibility. And I think that, you know, whether it's Google or others that are building out this technology in the industry, uh, we have the obligation to think about when uh, technology consumes significant amounts of natural resources and physical resources that we're really thoughtful and careful about the, imp the impact and the footprint of this technology and how it's built. Um, so, you know, when you look at the technical re report for Gemma, uh, you'll see we describe the carbon footprint, uh, our, the pre-training that we did, uh, we estimated uh, the carbon footprint for that. Uh, but also, you know, uh, Gemma's uh, from the pre-training, we TPU optimized. Um, and so our TPU data centers are actually carbon neutral. Um, but, you know, let's not aim for the minimum. And what, you know, is expected of us, I think that we should, just like we're innovating in the core technology, let's keep innovating on that front in terms of how we do this in a really sustainable way. Um, so I mentioned the responsible generative AI toolkit. Well, let's let's make a sustainability toolkit, like how to how, let's put together best practices and learn based on the learnings from the community that can help people understand how do I build on top of these models in the most sustainable way, regardless of hardware or environment where I want to run my applications. Yeah, so so that, that's a that's a big ask, Oriel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask, maybe, maybe I'm going to ask something somewhat similar, but um, I think we've seen the power of open source or open models in this case. Um, and one of the goals would be, um, obviously, everyone here would agree that the faster the model, the better the experience. So by having it in the open, we also hope that maybe we get some feedback on like, hey, someone did a cool optimization that, look, obviously we're, we have a team of very brilliant minds, but the world is very large and there's going to be innovation coming from elsewhere as well. So I think that's one of the very positive things I've seen as, as you know, many publications that were um, discussed before building on top of each other's technology. So definitely um, in terms of model efficiency, I expect that to be sort of, again, a win-win and will definitely take back any you know, innovations that we see in the, in the repositories and so on. Um, regardless of that, there is a natural tension when you also increase capability to make the model more efficient. Um, so you can think of generations of models going sort of one scale down, but doing the same things, right? So very naturally, we're very motivated to, of course, make the models more compute efficient. And in fact, that is literally how the team works day and night. Awesome. So we're going to call it there. Thank you for your time. And thank you for, for being so open. Well, thanks to everybody here. Thank you.